tonight. Uh, we have U.S. Navy senior scientist Steve Swartz will be telling a story about a remarkable and recent discovery of the long sought after cave on San Nicolas Island that is the likely home of the Lone Woman. The Lone Woman made famous by Scott O'Dell's uh, book, Island of the New Island of the View, <laughs> Island of the Blue Dolphin. That's right. At least you did. Please it. welcome Steve Swartz. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. I'm glad you muffed that one up, not me. So <clears throat> it would be kind of embarrassing for me to get that one wrong. So can we get the lights down a little bit? Who's got the lights? I just got them, like right in my eyes. <clears throat> oh, well. We'll continue on. <clears throat> anyway. Ah, here we go. Everybody, or lots of people at any rate, think they know the story of the lone woman because they've read this book, right? And this is a, a wonderful book. Um, I don't want to put it down at all. It is read throughout the world. Millions of people have read this book, and it's a wonderful, wonderful story. But it is fiction. It's based on a true story. Uh, and if you know much about Hollywood these days, when they say based on a true story, it doesn't mean a whole lot. In Hollywood, that's like, yeah, there was a woman. And the rest of it's all made up. Uh, but in, in, uh, in this particular case, when Scott O'Dell wrote this novel, and it was published in 1960 originally, that's 50 years ago. And since then, we've learned a lot more about the story. You can see some of these publications, these are scholarly works that came out, and they started coming out the very next year. Uh, and we've had this whole buildup of new and new information coming out that wasn't available to Scott O'Dell when he wrote his book. And I'm quite convinced that uh, if he was writing today, he would write a much different story. There are a lot more facts to weave the story around, which is what he did. And he did a really good job of that. Um, and he did, uh, his book does two really important things for us. One, it kept the story alive. The story had pretty much been forgotten about by 1960. You can find things written in the 40s questioning, is this a true story? Anybody ever hear about this? You know, it had pretty much had dropped out of public consciousness altogether. And Scott O'Dell brings it back in a very, very big way. The other real important thing for us is for most of our children or grandchildren, this is their first introduction to Native American culture and history. And this usually starts a whole series of discussion about Native Americans, who they are, where they came from, what happened to them, kind of a thing. So it's real important for that, and I don't want to dismiss any of that. But what we're looking at now is all this new, new research about new things we have found out. And we did present some of this a couple weeks ago at, at a conference. Uh, but what we didn't do at that conference was to weave all this new stuff back into the whole story so we can kind of retell the whole story a little bit more accurately. And I always preface this by saying, this is the true story today. Next year it's going to look a little different because <laughs> we keep finding more and more things out. Now some of these are, are, are kind of confirmed, they're done, but a lot of the little bits and pieces of the story are yet to be confirmed. Uh, and as we confirm them, we often find out that what we've been told is not quite the whole story. So we'll get into a little bit here. Uh, so just to refresh your memory, I uh, suspect this audience is probably pretty savvy when it comes to the Channel Islands. But San Nicolas is the furthest out uh, of the islands, which is why the information about the island gets a little, little vague. Even today, it's kind of a hard place to get to, even with all of our modern technology. Uh, and a real important part of our story is to recognize that the Northern Islands are part of the Chumash territory. The Southern Islands, though, are part of the Gabrielino or uh, groups that now call them, like to prefer to call themselves Tongva. So this is a totally different group. They speak totally unrelated languages. They're living a very similar lifestyle. They're living on islands, they're eating fish and shellfish, and using a lot of the same kind of tools. So their material culture, the artifacts, look very similar, but their actual culture is quite different. And this is, is kind of an important part of the story. So just keep that in mind as we go along. 
Now, the Nicolenos, as we call them, when we refer specifically to the, the natives on San Nicolas Island, had been living on the island for hundreds, if not thousands of years before this little guy enters the picture and becomes the, the major player in our story. Uh, otter hunting uh, becomes a very profitable business. Uh, it started really early on in the 1780s by the Spanish, but it wasn't until an American gets the idea of bringing these hunters down from Alaska who are really, really proficient in hunting otters and seals and things like this, bring them down that they, now all of a sudden they can increase their yield tremendously. And it becomes a profitable business at that time. Before that, the Spanish had been running the trade and had been relying on just trading with the Indians to get skins. And the, they didn't have anything that was that valuable for the Indians to trade for, so they weren't getting lots of skins. But it, it was a nice little trade. But once you started bringing down the Aleuts uh, or Kodiaks, uh, I don't know what a, uh, Native Alaskan is probably the better term to use, actually. They're mostly from the island of Kodiak, but the, the Russians had, had concentrated all kinds of different people onto Kodiak Island when they brought them down here. So they're being used, uh, becomes very, very profitable. Uh, and the first documented trip now to San Nicolas Island, which we now know, and this is the first contact the islander has with non-native peoples that we've been able to document, at least it was in 1814. When this ship arrives, the Ilmena, and the ship comes down and it brings uh, uh, some of these Alaskan hunters down to hunt otters on the island. And while they're there, there's a violent outbreak. You probably all kind of heard the story. Uh, what's new now is 1814 is the confirmed year that it happened. We've often heard 1811, but we can't, 1811 just doesn't pan out. The ship that was supposed to be in 1811 wasn't here in 1811, you know, but this ship was here in 1814, and there's documentation that this violent outbreak occurred during that visit here. And what's really interesting about this uh, is we've never been told the circumstances of this outbreak, okay? And uh, after this, since this was very much against Russian policy, Russian policy was to work with the natives, keep them friendly, because they needed them as trading partners. So when this all happened, there was an inquiry, and out of that inquiry, we learned the circumstances, the trigger point for this outbreak was that the locals, the Nicolenos, had killed one of the Alaskan natives. And in retaliation for that, the Alaskan natives killed large numbers, we're told, of the Nicoleno. We don't know the numbers. Um, I think we've all seen the accounts where, oh, they killed every male. Well, we know that's not true. Um, they, wiped, they didn't, obviously didn't wipe out the population because there's still people after this, so it's very unclear. Uh, but we are very hopeful um, that the records from that inquiry will be found. Uh, these were all being, the, the hunting was being controlled by the Russian-American company, and there are corporate records of this whole incident. Uh, the offender, uh, the guy in charge, um, Babin, was sent back to St. Petersburg to face charges. So we know that there was an official inquiry. There are more official documents yet to be found out there that may explain a little bit more of what actually happened, the extent of this, because uh, that's very much unknown. We do know that after this, when the Russians left the island, they left otter skins with the natives with instructions to pass them along to the next Russian ship that comes along. So there wasn't like this huge wipeout. It's this kind of this weird kind of thing going on there as to the, you know, this big violent outbreak. But yet st we're, they're still cooperating afterwards. So it's kind of an odd, odd thing. But but this did happen. We do now know know the date. We know the ship. We know the basic circumstances. And we're still hoping to find out more details about this that we can add to the story. But we know at that point in time, whatever the number was, the number had probably already dropped before 1814. Uh, probably because various diseases had been introduced, even just by natives trading with natives from other islands and, and the mainland, uh, passing things back. So it looks like the population had declined a bit already. After this incident, the population was quite low. Uh, numbers after the incident are, I think the highest number you'll actually see when anyone gives a number is like 30 people still on the island. 
Uh, but that'll vary down to 20. Um, we don't really know uh, how many people we're talking about. It appears that whatever that number was, it kind of dwindles over the years. That was 1814, and our next real picture of the island comes in 1835, when a ship is sent out from San Pedro to collect up the natives and take them back to the mainland. Now the circumstances, there's all kinds of nice stories as to about who sent them out and why. And this we don't know. We haven't been able to confirm any of this. But we do know this particular vessel uh, did come out, did land, did pick up the natives that were on the island, with the exception of the one woman, of course. And the rest of the people then were taken into San Pedro. Again, there's lots of nice romantic flowery stories about how she was left behind. And that's one of the parts of the story we really don't know. Absolutely do not. Just about any scenario you can, you can imagine is in print. Okay, we've all probably heard the story about how she got on the boat, realized her baby had been left behind, jumped overboard, swam back to the island to save her child, and by, she got, by the time she finds her child again, the wild dogs had eaten the kid, and that was the end of it. Well, you can, you can read that. You can read that, oh, there were two children. You could read, no, she jumped overboard, got back, and, and then realized that her kid was on the boat, and she was stranded. You can read that she just decided to stay. She ran off a hid. Uh, any, any scenario you want to imagine is out there. So we don't know. We, there's no firsthand account from anyone who was there that it, no one has, that we've ever found at least, that anyone there was ever written it down. Uh, the earliest version just says she was left behind with no real explanation. And that's probably the best we're really going to know uh, about what actually really did happen. Now we do know that the natives who were taken were taken to San Pedro. Okay. And we know when they arrived, we've got the record of the ship as to the date that it arrived with natives from San Nicolas. Now the number of, of natives that arrived there varies quite a bit. The lowest number, which I show here, is three. The highest number you'll find in print is 18 to 20. It's not specific, 18 to 20. You'll see a lot of references to seven or eight people. Uh, this is the only one that says three, and specifically there's one male and two females. All the others are just this number, and not even a precise number, it's a vague number. So we don't really know, but we do know it's a small number, which makes it even less likely that you're going to get on board and, and realize you forgot somebody. Because like your whole population is here in the boat, how did you miss somebody, you know? Uh, and certainly, uh, I think a lot of people have agreed with me that, you know, a, a woman who has a small child is not likely to just forget their child. I mean, that doesn't really happen too often. Um, but we don't, we don't know, uh, but it appears that it certainly it's a very small number, whatever the number actually is. Okay? Uh, there are stories about the one male that follows him up a little bit. He uh, stayed in the harbor area and continued to work in the harbor helping to offload boats. This is real typical. Boats would come in and they would anchor, have to anchor quite a ways offshore. And then they would use a small boat to bring the supplies in, and then they would be all offloaded by hand. And um, this is a well-known practice. And apparently he stayed in the harbor and did that for a number of years until he uh, died. He uh, apparently slipped and drowned. Uh, and so there's an account written in 1841 that says he has already passed away by 1841. So he's there for maybe five years. We're not really too sure. Um, the local legend has that he was actually buried out here on Dead Man's Island, which is a place where lots of sailors who were in the harbor, who from other countries and other places were buried. It's a real, be a real typical place to bury uh, someone like this. Uh, Dead Man's Island, however, was removed in 1929 to expand the harbor. Uh, the, the graves on the island that they could find at the time were relocated somewhere. But a lot of them had already washed out and, and has spilled down into the harbor. That's, that's pretty well documented. Uh, one of the real interesting uh, stories we found fairly recently is an account written in 1847. And according to that, the claim is that uh, Black Hawk, that was the name he was given, was actually the husband of the lone woman. And according to that version, when they had all gotten on the boat, she was on the boat ready to go and said, no, I can't do this, and, and she jumped off and left. 
left him sail away. Which if it's true, it may explain why he stayed in the harbor, didn't go somewhere else. Thinking that if she did come back, she would come back there. Because that's all, all he knew. So it would be a reasonable assumption to make that uh, if someone does go back to get your loved one, that that's where she's going to come. So we have a little bit of story uh, to go along with, with that part of the, you know, so this is good. So the early, uh, one of the important things is to remember that the early part of the story ties San Nicolas to San Pedro. Okay? The end of the story ties San Nicolas to, to Santa Barbara. And the Santa Barbara people don't ne really know what went on in San Pedro, and the San Pedro people don't know what's going on in Santa, you know. So it's kind of like two different versions of the story that are out there that are yet to be, yet to be uh, fully explored. What we do know is she was left behind to live on the island. And up until this year, that's about all I could say. It was like, okay, well, the next 18 years, I don't know what happens. But uh, in the last couple of years, we've made a couple of discoveries on the island you may have heard about that are tr starting to fill in that 18 years. The 99% of the story uh, occurred on the island. And we are now uh, finding out some pieces of that from the island itself. Okay. Uh, one of the um, versions of the story always say that she was left alone on the island and there was no other ship that could, big enough that could come out and get her, so she was just kind of lost and all to herself. Well, we've got a pretty good line of evidence now pointing to the fact that, no, in fact, there were plenty of ships that could make it out there. People were well aware of the fact that she was out there. People had come out tr and tried to communicate with her, tried to get her to leave. She refused to leave. She stayed out there. Okay. And we're starting to build up a list of confirmed uh, people or vessels that were at the island during those years. So it seems pretty reasonable that there were plenty of opportunities for her to leave if she had wanted to. Which begs the question, did she want to or not want to? Or, you know, uh, given the experience, I don't know, would you want to go or would you want to stay? Not knowing what's happening, but knowing what happened earlier, but not knowing what's happening now, you might decide to stay as well. Uh, don't really know what her thinking is, but uh, it, it appears fairly obvious she did have opportunities to leave. People were, were landing there um, uh, during that whole time period. Okay. And we've been told, a lot of you may have seen where she was, subsequently when she was found, she was found in this hut, this brush hut on the west end of the island. And a lot of people have assumed, oh, that's where she was living for the 18 years. Well, nobody in the right mind is going to live in a hut on one of these islands. If you've been out to those, you know what the weather can be like. It's no gentler on San Nicolas than any of the other islands. Um, so you would look for someplace else to live. And the, the earliest accounts make it really clear from day one that that's where she was found, but she actually had been living in a cave nearby. You know, if you had a cave, you would live in there too. Absolutely. And this cave, had the, the location had become lost over time. The people had gone out in the 1860s, 1870s, had seen the cave, had been in the cave, talked about the cave, uh, but the location was lost. Um, and in modern archaeological surveys, we have not found the cave. So that kind of begs the question of where is this cave, what is this cave, how could it possibly be a cave out there that we can't find? Uh, and I've been looking for it for a long time. Uh, well over 20 years, actually. And uh, it wasn't until we connected up with this old survey map of the island that the story starts to unravel. Uh, and we're told from this that this is, in fact, the cave where the Indian woman had lived for 18 years. They were pretty clear that that's, that's where she had been living. And once we found uh, a nice little detailed map, we could pinpoint the location. Okay. The problem being that the cave had been completely f covered over with sand. So we spent about six months digging down and clearing it out. And you don't really get a sense of scale from this photo, to tell you the truth. But from this, the, the lowest spot that we're at here to where we started digging is about 20 feet. Okay. Completely filled in cave, not visible whatsoever. And to the back, as far as we've gotten so far, it's about 75 feet deep. So it's a good, large, deep cave. And if you're out there, no matter how bad the weather is, you duck in here and it's nice, warm, comfortable. Even without a fire, it is nice and comfortable and warm just because you're out of the wind. That's the biggest, you know, the biggest problem is being in the wind out there. 
And once you're out of that wind, the temperature is much more reasonable to, uh, to deal with. And certainly in a cave, when it gets rainy, you know, if you're in a, a hut's nice, but if it's raining and, you know, how bad it gets, if there's a cave, you're going to be in it. Uh, so we're pretty certain that, based upon the fact that everyone believed that this was, in fact, her cave, and we've got an old map that pinpoints exactly where her old cave was, and the fact that we found it, uh, we're pretty certain that this is probably her cave. Uh, we have not yet uh, dug down into the actual occupation layer there to confirm that, uh, but hopefully we will be able to get to that at some point here. There's still a lot more of this, what we call overburden. This, this is sand on top of the deposit that needs to be removed. Um, but we're very hopeful that we have, in fact, found, found her cave, and hopefully over the next few years we'll be able to confirm that and present you a lot more information. And in these deposits should be her whole life as well as probably everybody who came before her. This is a really nice, large, large cave. So it has a lot of potential to have a lot of uh, deposits going back to day one. Okay. Another really amazing find we made recently was uh, these two redwood boxes that were filled with artifacts. And to give you an idea on how precarious this was, they were found right there. <clears throat> they have nothing to do with the cave. They're totally different. This is a couple of miles away from the cave. Now, we know from the accounts of the lone woman that she had this propensity of stashing things. When they were looking for her, they found a basket full of, of items that had been put in a bush. Uh, and one of the ways they knew that she was still there was they took the basket, threw it on the ground, came back a couple of days later, and everything was put back in the basket, and the basket was back in the bush. Well, that's pretty good evidence that she's still there. Um, we know after they find her, I'll talk about later, uh, she takes them to a place where she has food stashed in places, and it would be reasonable to have items stashed around the island. You wouldn't want to have to carry everything with you. Um, and so what we found were these two redwood boxes. Uh, with It's a whale rib on top of it. There's a asphalted uh, water bottle. There's, there's actually about three, at least three water bottles in here along with it. Up in this little cove, it's a very, very inaccessible place to get to. And the really fascinating thing about this is the fact that it includes Nicolaino native artifacts, it includes native Alaskan artifacts, and it includes historic materials. And those three cultures all kind of overlap at one particular time period, if you see where I'm going with this. <clears throat> now, these are the artifacts that were found in one of the two boxes, the smaller one. Okay. These are all Alaskan artifacts, very clearly Alaskan artifacts. Some of these others, uh, slate could be, uh, it's quite possible, but there are other possible sources for that. Uh, this, this is a big metal bar uh, that was found there, as well as just some caliche root casts and, and various other just bones, unmodified bones. So it's not just artifacts, it's also raw materials as well, which is why we're pretty certain it's a native accumulation of things. It's not a collection uh, that a pot hunter went out, found a bunch of artifacts and stashed them and never came back for them because they wouldn't pick up raw chunks of bone that have nothing to them. Uh, the other box, however, was a little more extensive <laughs> and includes a huge variety of things, including dolphin teeth, material, abalones in various shells, glass projectile points, wood-hafted knives with the handle still in place, very nice. A smoking pipe with the vegetable material still in it. <laughs> I don't know what happened to that, but it's, it's around somewhere. We're trying to get an ID on that, exactly what it is, <clears throat> by the way. A couple little effigies, which are very, very nice. A whole series of beads and unmodified bones, uh, some bald eagle bones and a whole variety of, of modified whistles, flutes, uh, wands, scrapers, a whole variety of things. And then within this, there was one specific little cache of artifacts. Uh, all these were found inside of these two abalone shells, and they were found, you know, closing themselves off. It wasn't 
all tarred together like sometimes we find, but they were just they were placed that way, and all these items were in there as a little jewel cache kind of thing. And if you notice, these two fish hooks here are absolutely unique. We've never seen anything like those before. We've seen some elaborate looking fish hook things that we know they're not really fish hooks, so they wouldn't really work, but they're they're ornaments or they're perhaps an artisan showing what they can do, showing off their skill kind of a thing. Uh, but we've never seen anything like that before. This is a very large abalone pearl. If you've seen those, they're very, very uh, um, amazing. They're still, still valuable today. They're traded today. Uh, and buttons and glass projectile points and things were in this school cache. Uh, the button, that is a uh, abalone. It's just abalone disc. Um, and the, the interesting thing about this, as, as I tried to, as I was alluding to, is the fact that the only time you get native artifacts, Alaskan artifacts, and historic artifacts that all overlap is, is between, well, certainly 1853 when she left the island and the earliest historic contact, which right now we can place at 1814. So it's a very narrow time period, which is really great. Uh, and of course, for that time period, guess who's the only one out there during half of that time period? So there is the definite potential that this is hers, or certainly her, her group, her people's artifacts. She would have been alive during the time when this was, was put there. So this now gives us a, a, a nice little glimpse as to what's going on. They're making use of, of historic glass and metal that they're finding. Uh, they're collecting up some of the Alaskan artifacts they're finding, uh, as well as uh, just keeping a whole variety of, of you know, beads and ornaments, as well as just raw material, just, just unmodified bone, fish bone, eagle bone. There's even a piece of cow bone in there that obviously got, got brought in. Uh, but just a raw piece of bone, a bunch of dolphin teeth, you know, raw materials. Um, and if, if, you know, if you look at it as a, like your toolbox, you know, you got a toolbox at home, and if you had a cabin in the woods, you probably have a toolbox there. So this is kind of her toolbox when she's in this part of the island. She had knives in there and all kinds of things, so as she needed them, they were there and available to her. So this, this really adds, adds a, quite a bit to our story. So I'm, we're really excited about this. Is, this is amazing discovery. I mean, uh, these tabloids, they're, they're normal size, about six inches. They're not particularly large, uh, but they're very... Um, uh, just, just very nice uh, condition. They've, they've been modified on, on the, you see the, uh, the ec external parts have been, been shaped. Um, and it's a really, really amazing, uh, amazing artifacts. Those are black abs. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right, so she's out there. I'll, um, Basically alone. I wouldn't say she's 100% alone because people are coming and going, but you're still alone, even if there, somebody shows up once in a while, especially if you're trying to avoid them. So she's alone until this gentleman comes along uh, in 1853. Actually, he makes a number of trips to the island, and on these trips is when he decides that she's still there. Uh, it's on, on the earlier trip when he, he, finds the ba he f finds the basket and dumps it out, and, and she puts him back in. So she knows she's out there. So he comes out, uh, and so he comes out in 1853, and he's been, been asked by everybody in town to find her. If she's there, if you think she's there, go out and find her, please. So he agrees to come out and, and dedicate some time. So they spend uh, an entire day looking for her. Okay, now he's coming out to hunt otters. So taking a day to go do something else is, is kind of a big, big investment of his time and effort. So it, it's, it's a big thing to do. And from the accounts that we've got, we can kind of trace the steps around the island. We know that they anchored down at this end of the island, which is still kind of the preferred anchorage, uh, as much as there are. They proceeded up the island this way. And on the way, they, they saw a number of these huts. And here, they're very explicit when they describe these huts as their windbreaks. They don't have a complete roof. They don't have a complete walls. They're just kind of a skeleton thing as a windbreak, which makes perfectly good sense. Uh, he sets up camp about the center of the island. The next morning, uh, excuse me, that day, he and uh, Carl Dittman proceed on up the island around the coast, and they make their way around um, to this. There's a spring, nice spring right here, and night ever takes a takes a break, 
Dittman continues on, comes up around the end of the island, and as he's coming around the end of the island, he comes upon a footprint. You see some footprints that are kind of high up on the beach, and he goes, well, that can't be any of our people, because I'm the first one here. He continues on up a little bit further, and he finds a piece of driftwood that in his mind is, well, it's up too high. It couldn't have gotten here by itself. Somebody dropped it here. So that's the end of the day. They go back to camp that night. The next day, Nader says, okay, we're going we're gonna to find her. We're going to spend the day. So then he takes a whole crew. They come back to the same spring. Nader sits down to take a break. Uh, the whole crew is sent across the island. This is, this, at the time, at least, was kind of a flat area across the island. They, they all proceed down the island, all the way across to the other shoreline, at which point Carl Dittman tells everybody to head back and very carefully search while he continues on up and goes back to the spot where he saw the footprint and, and the piece of driftwood. And as he is uh, following that up, he, f he comes across a couple of huts he sees up here. And in one of the huts, he sees some movement, which turns out to be her. Okay. And by reading the accounts, we can, we can say that this is probably the doom that she was found on. Uh, as he's approaching, you know, you can imagine there's a little, little hut here and there's a little bit of movement in it. Not, you know, at first he thought it was a bird or something there skipping around, but as he gets closer, he can see it's a head moving around inside. And he had already made a, made, they had established a signal that if he found her, he would signal the other man. And he did it by putting his hat up on his ramrod of his gun. And he signaled to them, they turned and they, they approached. And then when they got close enough, because they were very concerned that she was going to run away. When he, she, they got close enough, then he came around and kind of made it known that he was there. Well, as he's doing that, her dogs start barking at him, making a ruckus. She, she, she says something to the dogs, and they stop making noise. He comes around and presents himself and finds her there. Uh, she's in the hut, which is, in fact, a windbreak. Very, this is a very good uh, depiction of what they're actually seeing. Um, and she's inside here. Uh, she's got a little fire going. She's working on some baskets. You can see those little baskets uh, and, and other things uh, around the hut that she's been working on. And the first thing she does is she offers them food. Very gracious. Oh, welcome here. I'm cooking here. I'll cook up some, some roots. And uh, while the other men are, are, are approaching, uh, Garl Dittman is there, you know, trying to converse with her. Can't speak to her, of course, but uh, there. Uh, at that time, they try to signal for Nightover, who's down taking a nap at the spring, and he finally, finally gets up here. He's always credited with finding her, but he didn't find her. Um, just read the accounts. It's very, very clear. Um, and so they have this little uh, tete-a-tete here, and they're able to convey to her one way or the other that she needs to pick up her belongings because they're going. And she doesn't put up a fuss. She's okay. She starts picking up her stuff, and, and they help, you know, carry things from her. And after that point, we can retrace their steps um, by, by reading the accounts from, from the hut site. She takes them down to a, a spring where she has food items and other things stashed in the spring, in the rocks there. And then she takes them to another spring where she indicates that she's going to go down and, and, and clean up because she's going to bathe. And after that, they take her back to their camp. Okay. And the first spring she takes them to is this one, <clears throat> which was, it's got a variety of names, but Old Garden Spring is one of the oldest names. That's why I use it. And it's got these little pockets in here where you can see she easily could have sort of stashed. And the one thing they mentioned is she had food, uh, yeah, she had bones in there. And she would pull out the bones and suck on them as there was still some nourishment in them. Uh, but it still flows even today. Uh, it's a real nice, very prolific spring uh, on the island. Then she takes him to another spring, which is often called Thousand Springs today, uh, which uh, has kind of this dripping springs kind of a look to it, which would be a perfect place if you were going to bathe. You go where the water is already dripping on you, right? Makes, makes perfectly good sense. So she knew where she was going and, and the right places to go to do them. Uh, then they come back to their camp, which we're fairly certain was on this, this little beach here, uh, once again, everything's got variety, various names out there. But it's a nice little beach. A lot of people have camped here. It's got a nice cliff here that blocks the wind, and there's a nice little spring that comes out right here. So it's a really good place to camp. The first thing they do when they get her back here, they immediately put her in a boat and take, a, take her out to their ship. Because they're afraid she's going to run away. 
and they figure, oh, she's on the ship. She can't go anywhere, right? So they take her out of the ship, and she's there. It's kind of unclear how long, not very long, maybe a day. And they realize she's not going anywhere. She's fine. So they take her back to the island and um, set up a little, uh, and a little, they make her a little shelter to stay in. And they, give her, they make her up some clothes and give her a little shelter to stay in. And they proceed to go off and hunt otters for the next month. While she's there, uh, alone in camp, she goes and collects up water, she collects up firewood, uh, and the one thing she does, which is our best description of, she makes the woven water bottles. And we have a very nice description of how she does that, and this is one that we found right alongside the two redwood boxes. In fact, we found two completely intact water bottles along with the redwood boxes. So once again, another tie-in to her, or at least her, definitely her people. Very, very clear distinction there. So after a month, once they've gotten all the otter they can get, then they, they proceed into Santa Barbara. Remember, this is the Santa Barbara part of the story, not the San Pedro part of the story. So this is where some of the, some of the divergence in the story kind of goes, and they're saying what happened there, but they don't really know, and they're seeing what happened there, and they don't really know, so... It's, it's, you have to kind of piece it together very carefully. Who's saying what, where, and, and would they actually know that? And uh, they arrive in Santa Barbara uh, about the, the 1st of September in 1853. Some people say it was precisely the 1st of September. Others, well, it's about then. But that's close enough for our, our, our purposes. And Santa Barbara is still a sleepy little town. Uh, it's important to remember there's, there's no newspapers here. There's no newspapers in L.A. at this time. Um, the closest newspapers, interestingly, are up in the gold country, right? All the gold towns have newspapers. So some of the stuff we learn are from reporters from those papers who come to Santa Barbara and see her in Santa Barbara. That's where we get the you know, really you know, first-hand accounts. Most of the accounts that you'll read that are uh, easily available in print are accounts that weren't written down for 25 years. Nidavers and Dittman's official accounts weren't written down until 1878. So all these earlier accounts are much more likely maybe to be true because they're first-hand accounts, people who aren't trying to sensationalize the story or anything. They're just there seeing what they saw. And with her coming into Santa Barbara, it was quite, quite it just did create quite the stir. This is a time, this is in the middle of Victorian times when if you read the newspapers, they're all full of the latest discoveries or the new oddity or anything like that is, makes the papers around the world. And this one definitely does. This creates a, quite a bit of a sensation uh, in Santa Barbara. Oop. And when she gets to Santa Barbara, uh, George Nidever takes her to his home. And this is another new piece of the story, is where was Nidever's home in Santa Barbara? Oddly enough, that location had been lost too over the years. It wasn't until Susan Morris, who I've been, been working with uh, on this, uh, delved into the archives and was able to figure out where Nidever's house actually was. Now everybody knows Nidever had a, a very famous uh, location, Burton Mound, that he owned, but not at this particular point in time, he didn't. And the family had moved one play here and there. They had moved around Santa Barbara quite a bit. But the family owned uh, four blocks right about here at that time. And on one of those was Nidever's Adobe. And today, the 101 freeway goes right through the middle. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean there isn't anything left. And we're still pursuing that to see if there's any possibility of finding any remains of that. But this is one of those other things. When we started this, I had assumed that you know, the location of Nidera's home would be pretty well known in Santa Barbara, and I couldn't find it anywhere, and it turns out it wasn't very well known. It was, the location had been very, very much lost over the years. And unfortunately, we know she only lived for seven weeks. Okay. She uh, contracted dysentery, is what happened. Uh, a lot of accounts say it was aggravated by the fact she had fallen off the porch and it had injured her back. I'm not sure how that aggravates dysentery. Dysentery is bad enough by itself, uh, especially if you're coming from a culture where you probably never had dysentery, so you've got no, little or no resistance to it whatsoever. Um, 
But this is uh, sort of what, what happens to her in the end. Uh, and she was baptized with the name Juana Maria after she was already passed. Okay. People always say, oh, her name was Juana Maria. Well, no, she never heard that name. She wasn't given that name until a little too late. All right. And she was buried in the mission cemetery. And the precise location isn't known. There was this nice little plaque uh, on the wall in her honor. Uh, but that is, does not mean that that is where she is buried. Uh, it appears she's probably very buried in the vicinity of that plaque, but exactly where no one, no one knows at this point in time. Um, so we're doing quite well. We're doing here on time. Ooh. Got a couple last slides to go over real quickly here, just to wrap it up. Um, as I said, names. Uh, I've seen a lot of things about, oh, her name was Karana. Well, that was her name in the novel, yes, but that was not her name. Okay, we don't know what her name was. Okay. That's a fictional name. Scottsdale had to call her something. You couldn't just keep referring to her as that girl. You know, had to give her a name. So that makes sense. And as I said, Juana Maria was a name that she was given, but she had already passed away by that point in time, so it's really not fair to call her that. That's why I always refer to her as a lone woman, because we don't know her name, and it's kind of disingenuous for me to give her a name as, you know, as, a, as a researcher. But I, I can see the, the, the need you know, for Odell to do it, uh, so I don't have a problem with that. Um, we do have these uh, famous four words that the lone woman uh, said. And these four words were heard by Shumash, who were in the Santa Barbara area, who remembered these words and passed them on to a uh, linguist around the turn of the century. Once again, this is 50 years later. Um, but, you know, uh, Native peoples do have a little, little better capacity for remembering things than we do. And uh, the names were written down by a couple of different people, uh, slightly different spellings, but they, both, they basically are very similar uh, s words. So we have four words, and they've been looked at by, by linguists over the years, and from, from the very beginning, uh, it's been assumed that uh, at, well, at the time it was called a Shoshinian language, now we refer to them as a Udoaztecan, as the language family. Uh, but the Udoaztecan Tekken family is completely different from the Shumash language family. It's kind of like English and Chinese. They're like totally different. You know, they're not connected anywhere in the past. Uh, beyond that, with four words, you really can't say much. But her language is very consistent with being a Gabrielino or Tongva, which is what we've always been told. And, and everything else points to that as well. Nothing really remarkable there. Uh, you might see from us to, to the famous Toki Toki song. And you'll find various, inter various uh, presentations of what, that, what the words mean. Uh, when the linguist looked at those, she said, I can't find any words in there. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, a la, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah kind of a thing. Uh, but there is some potential that this could be worked on perhaps further. And we might find some more information about this. I was very hopeful that this was going to turn into something. But it, it hasn't so far, that's for sure. And it doesn't look like it really isn't much of anything. A number of her actual artifacts that she brought back with her to Santa Barbara uh, have surfaced over the years. Uh, she brought a number of things back. A lot of them were given to the Knight of her family. She handed some out to other people. Knight of her handed them out to various people. Uh, and they have been found around. And every few years, we kind of find another item here or there that always kind of creeps up. So that's an interesting. Uh, this is, these are interesting in terms of these are the things she chose to bring with her as opposed to maybe the stuff on the island, which was more of her overall uh, universe of artifacts. But these are things that she decided to bring with her. Uh, in uh, 1940, Drew, uh, Arthur Woodward, rather, went out to the island uh, to location, I said, is probably where her hut was. And he found uh, a number of whale bones there. And we know from the early descriptions that the, the, the foundation of the hut was whale ribs. Uh, and he reconstructed them and tried to make it look kind of like it would have at the time. Uh, so you'll see this photo out there a lot when you do research. And this, I, I agree, this is probably the, the site where she was found. But they did find uh, other huts while they were looking, when well, they found this one too, so it's not an absolute. Just because he found a hut here doesn't mean that is the one. And we have looked around here, we have yet to find any artifacts that are new enough to have been from her but there's always still that potential. We're still looking there. I, I think we might 
might find something new on that still today. And the other thing you'll see a lot out there is the supposed photo of, of the lone woman. Uh, there are a couple of major problems with the photograph. One, when she comes into Santa Barbara, she is very clearly described as being in her 50s, up to 60 even. One says, oh, she was, uh, she was definitely 60. And most people say, oh, it doesn't look like a woman in her 50s. I won't have to comment on that. But I will comment on the, the photographer who printed the photo, the fact that it was not even in Santa Barbara at the time. And... Uh, at that time, uh, it, it's always possible to reprint a photo that was done earlier, but at that time, the technology wasn't that good for doing that kind of thing. So it would be a very rare uh, instance, I think, for a photo from the 50s to be reprinted in the 70s. That would have been a very rare case. It possible it could have happened, but it, it seems very, very rare. But it was found in the night of her family home, so a lot of people have assumed that maybe this is her when in fact it could very well just be someone else who was in the, in the home or one of the workers who was associated with the home. Um, so that's a very uh, quick rundown. I only went a little bit over my time uh, on the story. I tried to cram it all in, but there's lots of more detail I'd love to go into, but don't quite have all the time for that, but I will entertain some questions, and if we can get the microphone. I'm going wherever the microphone goes. Sorry. <laughs> that's the The, the uh, chest that you found... <laughs> Are you saying that, that the chest was manufactured by the woman, or was it a chest of European or something like that origin? Because ah. I, I would assume if the chest, unless it was manufactured by her, those were not her artifacts. The chest, uh, the, both of the boxes are made of redwood planks, look, looking very similar to, like, to uh, Tomal canoe planks, or Tiat would be with the Gabrielino. <coughs> They were roughly glued together with asphaltum. There are some holes, but there aren't corresponding holes where they would have actually been tied. It looks like it was something that was just kind of pieced together out of bits and pieces that were laying around. It does not appear to be a manufactured wooden box. And we had thought about that too originally, because that would have been really interesting to see who, if it was a manufactured box where it came from. But it does not look, it's not uh, uniform enough. The pieces are all different sizes and they don't, they, kind of roughly fit together and they were roughly glued together, but it doesn't look like it's a manufactured box. Yeah, good question. Though. Is there, or would you expect to be, would you expect there to be smoke traces on the roof of the cave? You might very well expect to see that. The problem we have is, is, is one of geology. This is very soft sandstone. And at the, especially the outer part, it was completely filled with sand. I expect you probably had a fair amount of abrasion during that process. The cave is filled with sand that's being blown in from the front, as well as waterborne clays that are being brought in from back inside the cave somewhere. There's, there's an opening that allows a little bit of water in, so you get very, very fine layers to build up in there. One of the other interesting things I didn't get into is the fact that in the cave, and at this point when you're down at her level, it's about up here, there are a couple of engravings, historic na initials, with a date of 1911 attached to them. So the cave was still somewhat open, at least until then. Um, at least part of it was. I don't think you could have been on the same surface that where she would have been living, because I, I couldn't reach it. I'm 6'4", so it would be pretty hard to do. But I would think uh, one of the other things you may have seen is, in some of the accounts is that in this cave, she had, had kept track of things by marking on the walls and we haven't found any markings as well. Uh, but that could also be the, the victim of abrasion from the sand uh, being brought in. Because the sandstone, of the, uh, the island is almost 99% sandstone, and it's, it's not really hard, hard sandstone. It's fairly soft. Yeah. I'm curious about the dogs. What kind were they? When do you think they were introduced? Very good question. The dogs um, are um, the probably the typical Plains Indian dogs that are found all throughout most of North America. Uh, actually, we've got a, probably a couple of different breeds of dogs, but they're very common throughout North America. The oldest dog that we have dated on the island so far 
is on the order of about 1,500 years or so old. But there are lots of dogs that have been ex were excavated in the past that have never been dated yet. So I would not be surprised if they go back earlier. We know that the foxes were brought out to the island. And the earliest date is 5,000 years old. So I would not be surprised if dogs don't bake, date back just as far. And dogs, uh, just to give a little perspective, w if, among Native Americans, dogs are not really pets. They're work animals. And I equate these to your modern hunting dog. They're out there to hunt, help with hunting or something on that order. And so they're brought out and they're kept. And they're very well kept. We've, we have found them wh where they've had injuries that you, they could not have survived unless they had been cared for. And we find uh, where they have been fed, uh, not just fish, but cooked fish, which means they're, they're getting some pretty good, good scraps. You know, they're being well cared for. So these are real, I think they're very valuable dogs, probably to aid in hunting, collecting up uh, birds, and, or perhaps the other theory was being used like sheep dogs to help herd up sea lions to make them easier to hunt. Yeah. Back there. Do do we have any clue on when Corona was, well, what year Corona was born? Well, I think the best clue we have was the fact that in 1853, she's described as being in her 50s, which would mean she was born about 1800 give or take a fair amount, because estimating age, um, I have a terrible time with it, so um, I wouldn't want to go. But everyone seemed to be pretty sure she was in her 50s, uh, so I would think she was probably born around 1800. Yep. Yes, and what part of the island is, is the cave? Is that a secret? And, but what, and when would you think it was filled with uh, sand? To the, uh, the cave is on sort of the southwest part of the island. Uh, it's an old sea cave, but it's been uplifted to where it's, it's above the tide line. It's about 20 feet or so at elevation now. And the last real mention of the cave is about 1890. We've got the 1911 engravings in the cave. So I'm thinking, and we've got archaeologists combing the island starting in the 20s. So I'm thinking by about 1920, it's pretty well filled in. Uh, and this was why people didn't find it. And archaeologists would have found a cave, and you know, they, they make note of that, definitely. That's an important thing, because caves have such good preservation inside is, is why they're so exciting. And to find a cave that's been buried for almost 100 years that no one has dug into before is incredible, because it's got so much potential with modern techniques to find out what was really going on, not just with the people, but with the environment as well, going all the way back. Yeah. What caused you to look where the uh, boxes were? What was the giveaway that there was anything there? Well, the boxes uh, actually was a group of archaeologists who were out on a whole, whole different project. They were looking for, you know, there's the old adage, if you want to find old sites, you've got to find old dirt. Well, they had found an old soil horizon, and they were following it around the island. And it runs right through there. And as they're coming around the side, they see something that looks kind of odd on the dune there. And it turns out what it was was the, the end piece on one of the boxes actually had been blown uphill. And they saw that first. And then looked down, they saw this whale bone. So, well, okay, well, whale bone, okay, that's not that unusual to find. But then there's something underneath that. We better go check that out. And that was it. It was just pure happenstance that they happened to be there at that particular time. And another couple of weeks, it could have been completely washed out and gone but it had been buried, because we had been through that area many, many times before. Yes. Um, why, after 18 years, would the people of Santa Barbara insist that Nidiver go get that woman? Uh, that's a good question. A very good question. Um, don't really know that. Uh, I think it was, it was general knowledge she was out there, and I think uh, at the time, uh, since Nidiver was the one who was going out there, at least from Santa Barbara, we don't know who was going out there from other places. Uh, there could have been other people, certainly. Uh, and just because he was going out there, and of course he's the one who's going back to Santa Barbara saying, oh, I, I saw a footprint, or oh, I found this basket of stuff. You know, he's telling people, he's seeing things that, so they're like, well, you need to go find her. You know, and there's some talk about uh, someone, it's usually ascribed to the Mission Padres, offered him money to go out. Well, they didn't offer it to him, they offered it to somebody else, Tom Jeffries, who was another 
otter hunter out. Uh, so I don't know if that was just a standing, anybody who brings her in will pay, you know. Um, it's, it's reward, but it's also an incentive. If you're, you know, running a boat, you're going to run out to an island just for the heck of it? No, you're going out there, you're, you know, that's, that's money. That's costing you money just to go out there, to take your crew out there. You know, so it's a little, a little incentive, a little help to, to make somebody, it made him spend the day looking for her at least. And then he spent the rest of his time hunt, doing uh, hunting otter, which is what he came for. A lot of people say, well, they found her and they brought her back. Well, no, he, they found her and then they went hunting, which is why they were there. It's, it's, it's still, even today, it's economics and someone might go out and do something nice, but if they're out there, you know, to go fishing or whatever, they're going to continue to do their job too. Okay, we, we have time for one more question. One more question. Sir, right. right over here. Gotta wait for the mic. Because she was returned to Santa Barbara, but nobody could speak her language, was she Chumash or was she Gabrielino? We, she's Gabrielino. And when she came into Santa Barbara, of course, there's plenty of Chumash around. And they came down and tried to talk to her. They could not communicate with her. They figured out that, hey, something's wrong here. So they started, you know, they, they pieced together the fact that her rest of her people went to L.A. and they started to send for, for uh, from other groups that were further south. But she only lived for seven weeks, so they didn't have time to finally get down. They probably, if, if she had lived longer, they probably would have been able to find someone who could communicate with her. You know, it's just a matter of time and, and knowing what the problem is and trying to fix it. And I think they figured out what the problem was, and they tried to fix it, but she just didn't live long enough to actually have that come, come through. It would be, yeah, we'd have way more of the story if someone could have talked to her, most definitely. Well, we will stick around. If there's more questions, please come up. But let's give Steve a big hand, a big hand of applause for Thank a you. very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.